All right, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Shazia Sadek. I'm a professor of computer science from the University of Queensland. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome everybody to this session, The Future of Technology and the Human Story Behind It. So can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we work, live, and learn, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. So a quick uh, introduction to our session. Uh, before I introduced our speakers, um, we, uh, the, the, the session is pretty much, I'll ask um, each of our speakers to provide an opening statement, and we have some pointers for them, and then we'll open up the session for, for Q&A. Uh, for uh, all the participants joining us online, you are very welcome to start putting in your questions at any time. And for all the participants in the room, there is, I believe, a roaming mic, um, so that can come to you at that time. So we have got a fantastic speaker over here. Uh, in this symposium, there's been lots of talk, of course, about, about technology, about computing, about digital. Uh, you've got Toby Walsh and Feng Chen and, and Linda McIver here. Um, and I am going to um, start uh, with my introduction to Toby Walsh. And uh, with great difficulty, I tried to condense Toby's bio, <laughs> and I will do my best in, in, in um, uh, in, in saying that out. Um, so uh, for those of you who, who don't know Toby, there might be uh, very few. Um, Toby is a leading researcher in artificial intelligence, a laureate fellow, a uh, scientific professor of artificial intelligence in the School of Computer Science uh, and Engineering at UNSW Sydney, also an adjunct fellow of CSIRO Data 61. He was named by the Australian newspaper as a rock star of Australian Digital Revolution. Elected as a Fellow of Australian Academy of Science and of course also of Etsy, a Fellow of the ACM, the Association of Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, uh, known to many of us as AAAI, and the European Association of AI as well. And has won numerous prestigious awards, including the prestigious Humboldt Prize, as well as the New South Wales Premier's Prize for Excellence in Engineering and ICT and the ACP Research Excellence Award. So, Toby, let us talk about AI. Um, so the current hype, if I can call it a hype, or the upswing in AI, is not the first one. We've had um, two previous um, occasions on which AI was going to change the world, and then things didn't work as it was planned, and then we saw AI winters. So please help us sift through um, the hype from the opportunity. Tell us what is different this time. I, I'll just say one thing, though. Um, my daughter thinks it's hilarious that anyone thinks I'm a rock star. <laughs> I, do not, I do not own a leather jacket. I, I don't throw the, um, the TV out of the window when I'm in a uh, hotel. Um, I'm, I'm not actually even very musical. So. But I'm sure it's going to be on my gravestone now. <laughs> the Australian chose to give me that name. Uh, seems to haunt me from there onwards. But yes, you're right. Um, uh, AI has gone from some booms and busts in the past. Um, I've been working in the field now for more than 40 years. And, but I have to say, it is the most exciting time to work because you can't open a newspaper. And I'm sure if I open the Sydney Morning Herald today, there will be multiple stories of how AI is doing something interesting and new, or multiple stories of how people are concerned about how AI is doing something interesting and new in their lives. Um, and that, I don't think we've ever had that happen in the past. And I think there's still a, a huge <coughs> technical distance we have to go to build machines that can match human intelligence. I'm, I'm pretty confident we will eventually get there, but, but there's still a big mountain to drive, but, but we can, oh, sorry, but we can, we can already do some pretty um, important things, pretty useful things for machine to say. So if we stopped making any technical progress in AI today and only worked out how to take the ideas that we've already developed and apply them more widely to more, more aspects of government and business uh, and education elsewhere, we would still have a lifetime of work to, to just to apply what we already do. So I, I'm pretty confident then that um, we probably are at the peak of the hype cycle of AI at the moment, um, and there's surely going to be 
um, a, a downswing that will happen. But even if we have a downswing, I'm pretty confident that AI is here to stay, and AI is here, and it's leaving the laboratory. Um, we set up um, a new AI institute at, at UNSW recently, and we actually went around the whole university looking at who is using AI, where, who's working with AI today in the university. And of course, it turned out that there were way more people outside the School of Computer Science using artificial intelligence in the Department of Physics, in the material scientists, in the chemical engineers, um, than in the School of Computer Science. Um, so it's really left the laboratory. It's turning up not just in other faculties, it's turning up in business and elsewhere. So I'm, um, why has it taken 50, 60 years to do that? Um, Exponential feedback loop like that. <laughs> oh. Nice segue. <laughs> uh, actually, it's a story of four exponentials. Um, we are a room full of engineers, so you, you, you will all know what exponentials are. But I think even, even, the, even the public, courtesy of the pandemic, uh, started to understand exponentials are quite, um, quite important. The, the, uh, one exponential that you all know of, because it has a name, which is Moore's Law, so the fact that compute now is just so much more powerful. Things that we tried to do 10 years ago, we can now do, it, it, largely in part because we've got the compute to do it. Um, there is, you know, a, a, lot, a lot of compute on your device. If there's not enough in your device, there's almost infinite amounts of it in the cloud. So that's one exponential that's really opened up opportunities, <laughs> things that were just not technically possible. We have the compute to do it. Um, the second exponential, there's four, I, 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 and interestingly, all of these exponentials have roughly two-year doubling times. So Moore's law had, had, had a two-year doubling time, although Moore's law is technically dead, but um, until recently, Moore's law was doubling every two years. There's a similar doubling every two years in data. Um, we're collecting data in, in all our devices. The internet is, is generating huge amounts of data, and a lot of AI these days is driven by machine learning, which is hungry for data. But increasingly, we are, waking, we are having that data. Business are waking up to the fact that one of the most valuable things that they have is the data. So that's the second exponential. The third exponential is that, uh, not been going on for so long, but we have been improving the algorithms. I mean, people like myself and Fang have been working on improving the models and the algorithms. And if you look at various measures like error rates in computer vision, there's been a doubling in performance again for the last 10 or 12 years um, in those algorithms. Um, so those are, all, those, those are three technical uh, exponentials that have contributed to it. And the fourth is nothing to do with technology, um, nothing to do with engineering, it's to do with money. There's been a doubling of the amount of money going into the field. If you look at the amount of venture capital, you look at the amount of money that um, is in being invested. There are billion dollar bets being made not just by nation states, but by companies. A, large, a lot of large tech companies are putting billion dollar debt bets on artificial intelligence. Um, and equally, there's a huge amount of venture capital again, which has been doubling in the last couple of years um, into um, AI startups. Those four things together are a recipe for making significant progress. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, Toby, that, that does set the scene for, for what we're going to talk, um, talk next. So um, now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Feng Chen. Uh, so distinguished Professor Feng Chen is an award-winning internationally recognized leader in AI and data science. And uh, Feng has created some groundbreaking research, evidenced by over 300 research publications, science engineering, several books included um, over 30 patents filed in Australia, US, Canada, Europe, Japan, Korea, Mexico, and China. Wow, Feng. And um, Feng has been leading multidisciplinary teams of experts, developing digital transformation strategies, executing them with leadership and passion, and her experience in solving complex real life problems in large scale networks span many application areas, transport, water, energy, health, agriculture, and many more sectors. And in 2018, um, Fang won the Oscar of Australian Science, the Australian Museum Eureka Prize for 2018. 
um, and in 2016 she was awarded the Water Professional of the Year by the Australian Water Association. So definitely an impact that goes beyond our field. And in 2021, Fang won the Australian New Zealand Women in AI Award in Infrastructure and the New South Wales Premier's Prize for Science and Engineering. It's a great pleasure and honour to have you here, Fang. Um, so I'm going to pick up on something that, um, that uh, Toby said and also, um, you know, from your, from your profile because um, there is work that is happening in computer science um, departments, but indeed as we go out across campus and across to our research partners and our, our government and industry partners, there is so much more work going on out there. So we know the power of collaboration, we know the importance of collaboration both in terms of cross-disciplinary teams but also beyond academia into research and government but we also know that's very hard and you have navigated that with brilliance so tell us your secrets there. Thank you Shaz. So this, uh, the secret is actually uh, problem oriented and um, this is coming why this era becomes so interesting because of the business needs. So business needs uh, come from a take, I always try to take a, the use cases or stories. Um, we all drink water. So water coming out of the pipe, coming out of the tap, you, we think it's automatic coming, but there's lots of work underneath um, to do that. So if you're looking out of Sydney, uh, the average age of the pipes is almost 90 years old. And just thinking about if a 90 years person and then what sort of uh, uh, history you want to know uh, from doctor perspective, what history you want to know and what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of usage you see it and then what kind of activity you have over the time and what sort of monitoring you, you should have over the, uh, the time. But the challenge is uh, because of the digitization not coming early when the, when the pipe was laid. So the, the coming much later, even though we have a record from paper trans, trans, uh, trans, uh, transferred into a digital format, but the real in terms of like a, what's happening, like an incident uh, records only happened last 30 years. So uh, that brings a lot of challenges because uh, first thing, we lack of data in overall. Even looking at the Sydney water, uh, over last 30 years, this is not secret, uh, over last 30 years, uh, the failed pipes probably only less than 1%. So 99% is the healthy pipes, even though 90, 150, some of them, years old. So you, you have a typical, we call sparsity issues uh, coming from, from uh, computer science or, or machine or whatever perspective. So how you, you fill in those gaps, you have to rely on certain knowledge. The knowledge coming from, you know, people have domain knowledge, understand, uh, you know, what type of uh, symptoms from the pipe, say, material, material science. So cast iron pipes and what sort of a decay curve may look like, even though those ones may not be absolutely accurate, but it's a provide a certain prior to what we try to guess into. Then you're looking into, uh, in order to keep quality, you're actually dosing a lot of chemicals in. And chemicals has interaction with the materials. So what the chemical dosing, the amount, uh, in order to keep quality and what's the interaction and the damage towards the pipes or potential damage towards the pipes. And uh, uh, even more than that, if you're looking at uh, where the pipe uh, buried is on the sandy uh, surface, uh, sorry, on the sandy uh, ground or in the, above the rocks. So you need to look into geology, looking into something like that uh, to see what's the impact. And then uh, the last one, not least one, uh, is we're looking into the, uh, the traffic conditions, right? <laughs> if you, you have a, a lot of heavy you know, vehicles passing by those ones, of course it's a break easier, right? And then, uh, I mean, I don't mention about things like uh, soil attributes, which is acidic or not acidic, and then uh, the running, 
uh, load, workload, and uh, that links to hydraulics as well. So how you pump. So basically, it's even looking at one business problem, it's not only computer science problem. It's, it's just wrapped around uh, so many different domains, different expertise that all need to work together in order to solve that problem. So, uh, and then over last, and so I've been working in water, you know, more than a decade. And uh, more than a decade worked with more than 30 utilities globally, including, you know, almost uh, all the major utilities inside this country, uh, almost all of them in UK, and uh, some in other European countries, Netherlands, for example, and uh, Asian countries like Singapore, uh, Hong Kong. So the challenges the industry facing is very similar. Very similar is all the infrastructure assets aging. However, the maintenance money is not <laughs> increasing. So on the side, so like a, the investment year, that's why the investment comes because they know people can't, or agencies, whoever can't pump in, you know, double of the maintenance money. If they don't cut, you will be laughing. So with the assets getting uh, aged and then uh, try to maintain the same service level to our citizens, the biggest challenge is how to do it smartly and how to use maintenance money uh, smartly. So one of the things we've been keeping doing is utilizing all the knowledge we gained from cross-disciplinary or multidisciplinary team, as I mentioned before, and try to predict or prioritize the risk of the pipes. So, uh, and then what we achieved for Sydney region is our top, sorry, like a, uh, 10, 20 percent, the top ranking of the pipes will cover 80 percent of the the failure for uh, for future, which we already been running this uh, you know weekly validation with uh, Sydney Water and other utilities like uh, for five years. So every every week we receive what whatever report, whatever we, our prediction is, or what's the situation will look like, and they adjust that one. So now it's very stabilized. And the last uh, worth mentioning is. Uh, we, you, you mentioned the, the data. Data is not only coming from past history and the recording of the incidents and the pressure uh, running in the pipe, etc. Now we have a luxury to put in a lot of other sensors in. For example, acoustic sensors, IoT sensors, to listen into the pipes and to try to find the leaks. So by implementing, that's about only about 400-ish uh, leakage sensors across uh, three so like uh, suburbs or zones we tested in last 18 months. That's already saved like a 5,000 megaliter water. Yeah, that's if you, we try to visualize the water amount is about 2,000 uh, of you know, Olymp Olympic pools. So that water has been saved and, uh, and easily more than 10, 20 million uh, savings and uh, not, uh, not uh, even talking about the other uh, potentials that uh, stop the disruptions of the traffic when the, uh, caused, uh, sorry, uh, caused by leakage and uh, inconvenience or people's life, all those ones. In the, only in the water savings, that's, a, that's a huge. So uh, to, in, in, uh, to summarize, I think now it's a really interesting era and uh, a lot of uh, opportunities as well as challenges in order to address business need or society growth, whatever, uh, uh, you know, requirements. And fundamentally is, you know, we work as a, a multidisciplinary team and try to aim to solve the problem rather than divide, you know, whose job is what. Yes, thank you Could so much. Thank you, absolutely. So people often say, uh, you know, you're an academic, you're making a real impact in Sydney Water. The only way you can achieve that is if you have a strong advocate within the business. Is that true? That's absolutely true, but that the trust is gained through your action. So if, if, if you don't prove that you can do something different and can change business, you know, some of the process and then make things different, and it's very hard. I'm actually very proud. I'm, my photo is on the 
leakage management menu of Sydney, <laughs> of Sydney water. Yeah, maybe you can check that. It's, a, it's very funny, they're internal. And then when they sent to me to review, I said, you don't need to put my photo there because I'm not working for Sydney water. <laughs> but, but it is true, so <laughs> my photo was there. And, and you very know, proud. as you were, yeah. yeah, absolutely. As you were explaining it, you know, I, I could see your dedication uh, in understanding the domain. So, you know, we, we have to go that extra mile to understand the domain. Um, AI is no magic, it's not a switch. Um, it's hard work to, to, to actually apply it in different contexts. Uh, so, so, understanding of the domain, we are not domain experts, but understanding of the domain is absolutely essential, and that comes with working with teams and earning their trust. Love it. Thank you, Frank. Okay, so um, let us move on to our third speaker, um, Linda. Um, so Linda is the Executive Director of um, Australian Data Science Education Institute. Um, author of a very interesting book, uh, Raising Heretics, Teaching Kids to Change the World. A passionate STEM champion, advocate for equity and inclusion, uh, Linda founded uh, this institute, the Australian Data Science Education Institute, in, uh, in 2018 to give all students the chance to become excited about solving real problems and changing the world. She brings data science to life by designing meaningful projects, empower those involved to solve those problems, and making a positive difference. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. And um, she's been selected as one of the inaugural superstars of um, STEM by Science and Technology Australia, appeared in ABC's Q&A, is regularly sought to educate the educators, and we had lots of discussion on that in the morning for those of you attending. And um, uh, th throughout that sector, and uh, Linda has a PhD in computer science education and a lived experience as a secondary school teacher. So Linda, would love to talk to you about education. You know, we, the ATSI released the education report yesterday which covered digital skills among um, four other areas. Um, digital skills has been on um, the talk of this symposium uh, for the last two days. Um, and, and you know, what that means for responsible and innovative technology development, you know, what those skills, um, you know, the criticality of those skills to, to, to that discussion. And more than that, on just um, creating the awareness or sort of the literacy around technology use. So please share your insights. So I want to start by saying that I, I like the way you introduced that. One of the um, things that we tend to forget is we're not just building digital skills in children in order to um, to have more people come through and work in STEM. That's obviously critically important, we know that. But we also need to have, as a society, enough literacy and enough awareness that we can actually have a rational conversation about the way the future is going to be and that we can contribute to the design of the future rather than letting it be designed by people like Musk and Zuckerberg. <laughs> so I'm going to come at this from a slightly unexpected angle. This walking stick was made for me um, by a friend. Uh, it's custom made, so it's exactly the height that I need it to be. It is made from reclaimed timber, so it's sustainable. It's finished with a hard-wearing natural wax, which is non-toxic and you know, environmentally sound. It is a glorious thing of great beauty that brings me enormous joy every time I use it. Now I ask you, how often do you look at a piece of technology, whether it's a car or a phone, a bit of software or a microwave, and think, this is a glorious thing of great beauty which brings me great joy? We don't think that about technology. It frustrates us. We take it for granted that it will bite us. It will lose our work. It will frustrate us. It won't work the way we expect. We, we just assume that technology is going to be a problem. We spend all day adapting ourselves to technology instead of technology adapting itself to us. I currently have a microphone pack tucked into my dress. Um, I, you know, we wear headphones all day to avoid uh, creating echo, even though they're horribly uncomfortable. We contort ourselves in all kinds of horrible positions to read tiny little labels that have crucial information that we need in order to register or get uh, support for a device. We have five different authenticator apps and have to keep track of which service each app um, applies to, and I can never remember which is which, we, we 
we take it for granted that we have to do this. Uh, we have to solve those, those problems every day. We have to make it all work. And don't get me started on my gov. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> currently, my tax is both submitted and not submitted at the same time, which is Schrodinger's tax return, apparently. <laughs> it's nuts. We, but we take it for granted that this is the way it has to be. And it doesn't. We could be demanding glorious things of great joy from technology, and we don't. And part of the reason that we don't get that is that the teams are not diverse. We have uh, an obvious women problem in technology. We lack women to an extraordinary degree, but we also lack non-binary folks. We lack indigenous people. We lack people who are mobility impaired. We lack people who are vision impaired and deaf. We lack people who don't have great internet access at home and therefore when it drops out, the system has to be able to handle that. How many systems have you worked with that don't handle the internet dropping out? It's, it's crazy. Um, we lack people who think differently, people from different cultural backgrounds. We lack people who have those innovative, diverse, really radical, um, radically creative <laughs> solutions to the problems that we face. And we know that the reason we lack those people is we lose people to STEM in primary school. And we lose them because we teach them that STEM is toys. It is playing with robots, it's drawing pretty pictures, it's, it doesn't matter, it's not important, you don't really need to test it, just make it do something fun and walk away. And it's not enough that it be fun, particularly because a lot of kids don't find it fun, they find it frustrating and irritating. But fun isn't what we need. And it's not actually what drives our kids. Kids want to make a difference. So what if, instead of giving them toys, what if we taught them that STEM was about solving real problems, about making change in their own communities? What if we taught them from the very start of school, from preschool even, that STEM skills are not only things they can do, but they're things that are worth doing, and that they can use them to change the world. And they don't have to wait until they're adults to change the world. They can be changing the world from five years old. We all know the stories of the kids who you know, make an amazing ambulance app or you know, do something fabulous for climate. Those kids, we think, are extraordinary and, and outliers. We could actually be empowering every kid to be those extraordinary outliers. That's you know, why I called my book Raising Heretics. We, we really need to, to create a world where kids are making change and kids are contributing solutions and kids are learning that these skills are skills they can use to change the world. They're not things that are pointless and frustrating and unimportant. Now imagine the future we could build if every kid learned that from the start of schooling. Thank you, Linda. That's very powerful. And, and it's really important for us, and we've had this discussion in the symposium, you know, including when we were launching the education report, to, to, to understand um, the different lenses with which we look at digital skills and to get our head around you know, a shared understanding of when we're talking about digital skills, really what do we mean by it? And I really like that you know, we, we, can, we can think about learning of digital skills, right? And, and a lot of us do that in our classrooms, so those of us in computer science, so that's like, and it starts very early. But there is also learning for a digitized world and, and they're not both are not the same. So, so I think um, really excellent points. And um, with this, I think we can move over to our, our Q&A section. So I'm going to, uh, oh, we have a whole range of questions here. <laughs> Fantastic. OK, so um, our first question is from Anonymous. Uh, as we bring more services into the digital space, do we need to be investing in UX, so user experience designers, at the same rate as we are investing in data scientists? So products are both intuitive and beautiful. I, I just want to kind of scream, yes, yes, we absolutely <laughs> do. I, I, you know, the friends I was staying with last night, um, they, they had someone, uh, a guest, trying to operate the dishwasher and he couldn't operate the dishwasher. This is a man who works in tech and is extraordinarily skilled and couldn't figure out how the dishwasher well, works. He's a man, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, uniquely disadvantaged in that respect. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, uh, we got a new oven and it's, it's very difficult to figure out how it works. So, you know, it has 50 different um, settings. What do we do? We use two of them because we, we've figured those out and we know how they work and they're good enough for most purposes. Um, usability, user interface, it's a, it's a disaster out there. Um, there are people doing extraordinary work, but too often companies don't consider it at all or they kind of think they can paste it on at the end. Um, you know, we have conversations about education that don't involve teachers. We have conversations about technology that don't involve users, and, and that can't end well. So, yeah, it's fundamental. Mm. It's crucial. Thank you. Thank I mean, you, if you look, look, why is Apple such a successful company? Is because they spend a lot of time and effort on uh, interface. It's not, it's not because their computers are any better than anyone else's. Mm. It's because they've spent more time. Uh, We've we still a long way to go, but they spend much more time on the user experience. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we have another question here, and I might start with you, Feng, on that one, because it's about um, data quality, and it's a topic very close to my heart. That's my research area. So organizations have more data than they know what to do with or can realize the value of. So how do we equip leaders, number one, to see the value in their data, and number two, to convert it into information that can drive business decisions. And what are the barriers and potential solutions for that? That is a very big question. Have a go, Fen. That's a, that's a great question too. Yes. So I think it's a day in, day out. Probably we, we're all in those kind of, uh, kind of a conversations constantly. Uh, that's a start from what I said before, which is the business need. I think uh, to convince anyone to get on the journey probably is that have to have some hypothesis of uh, what this data can eventually turn out and to make difference in the business. And then, uh, so those probably this is the first conversation to, to have, and then that will link to, of course, there's some kind of a um, you know, check up or auditing into the data quality, whether your hypothesis is even, even realistic. So, um, my own experience, I never had the no perfect, 100% perfect data, but I never found any data sets is completely useless too. So it's between one to hundred, and it sits where you you are. And then next one is uh, to making this uh, try to uh, se se uh, surrogate them into or separate them into different chunks. If you try to have a grand <laughs> to solve the, all the problem by in one go, that's very hard as well because either your data quality or your some kind of a computing, uh, you know, even the accuracy, or sometimes is when you have the decision, what do you do? The, the process needed to be, you know, linked and synchronized. And it's always good to start from, you know, little but and the small objective as a POC or you, you call something MVP uh, or some just a little project which you can convince all the stakeholders. You bring, using that one, bring all the stakeholders on, on board and from data and check the quality to uh, domain expertise who's using data or using the process and look into what changes you may be able to make. And from that on to see uh, what kind of a process you actually need to make that change happen in the state. So that's actually, it's a, it's a, it's a complex uh, system, but when you work out a little piece, bit, uh, bits and pieces there, and uh, you can see that a uh, roadmap is uh, quite clear, and if you can demonstrate this to all of, uh, part of your shareholders, I think the chance of, uh, of getting people on board is just uh, greater. Yes. Yes, and I, I really like your analogy, and I also talk about it in my, in my own work. We've, we've sort of put a label of information resilience across this, you know, robust data pipelines. And indeed, there's baby steps. This You have to chunk it up. And you mentioned the data sparsity problem with the water pipe incident reporting. So, of course, with sensor networks, there's lots of noise and calibration issues. You know, when we come to human data, there's all sorts of other issues with biases and so on. But there are ways. So, like you said, no data is complete useless. It may not be, you know, ready to use, but it's also not useless, and we just got to work through it systematically. Thanks for that. Thank um, I we think have it's a, also immensely yes, important to bear in mind that there is no such thing as a perfect data set, but that's not the way we teach it. We teach, we teach a process, and we give them 
uh, we give the students a data set that exactly fits that process and brings out the perfect curve or does you know, exactly what we expect it to do. Data doesn't work like that in the real world. There is no data set that works like that in the real world. And so you know, th it's this idea that, which I think prevails in business often, that, that the data can tell us exactly what we want it to tell and also that the result is perfect and inviolable and there is only one result. And so to get the idea through that this is, you know, this is a, an indistinct science and that, that there are multiple <coughs> interpretations and data can tell you what, but it can't tell you why. And that sort of whole conversation around the nuances of data is um, very easily lost in the rush to data riches. Yes. Yes. Um, we have uh, two more questions here, but they are sort of similar questions. Um, and so um, uh, I'll ask all of you to comment on that because it's really good. So there's a question from Hugh about um, outside machine vision and speech recognition. What is the most commercially valuable AI application? And then the second question is, what is the unrealized um, opportunity, um, the, as in capitals, the unrealized opportunity for the application of AI ML that we should start looking at and realizing. So it's, a, I guess both questions are about, you know, the killer application, you know, beyond um, computer vision, speech and language have been pretty instrumental in the, in the current sort of upswing and, and some amazing successes. Um, so, yeah, Toby. It's, it, it, it's, it's hard to name a single one, so I'm going to name two. Go for it. <laughs> um, which is precision medicine and precision education. Um, to, to invent, I don't know if that term exists, but, but the idea that we are going to be able to... You know, med, medicine, you get the same medicines as me, which makes no sense at all, because your biology is very different to mine. Um, not, not only the fact that I'm a man and you're a woman, but, but you know, we can now read your DNA, we can actually say a lot more about your biochemistry and we shouldn't be giving you the same medicines, treating you the same way as, as you treat, treat me. Yeah. Um, so the, the prospect that we can use the vast amounts of data that we're starting to collect, the fact that we can read and write DNA um, and AI is going to, is the only thing that's going to be able to make sense of that. Um, just to give you an example of the potential power you can do, there was some work published um, a few years ago totally blew my mind when I read the Nature paper on this, which was that you can, you can take DNA, a person's DNA at birth, or even in, in vitro, and you can predict how tall they're going to be, to within an inch. You can predict, you know, maybe predicting how tall you are isn't particularly useful, but you can predict whether you are going to have, um, be susceptible to bowel cancer. And um, one of the thir third most deadly cancers, um, most of the deaths of which are, are completely avoidable, other than the fact that because it's bowel cancer, you don't tend to notice it till it's too late and you can't do, deal with it. Well, now we can tell at birth whether you're someone who, in the wrong environmental factors, you'll, um, you'll have um, bowel cancer, and so we can start screening you and prevent that uh, unnecessary death. So, uh, and uh, the idea that we can make medicine so much more personalized, I think, is, offers so much potential for all of us to live longer, healthier lives. And, th and then the same with education, I think. We've, we've barely scratched the surface on being able to provide tools that can um, provide personal experiences um, to people and personalize the, their, their learning journey for them. Okay, uh, that is a great question, but is also a question harder to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just use uh, two examples to follow your lead. One is uh, relationship discovery. Uh, you mentioned that a little bit. In we see a lot of the data. So with data, you you see some of the correlations, but correlation doesn't mean causality. So how you actually have uh, so this is I mean can't name one algorithm or etc. But it is a general in that ballpark is discover causality. That's I mean through metadata through uh, a very different uh, heterogeneous uh, sort of a different, uh, you know, span data, different uh, characteristics of the data to discover the relationship. That is uh, very, very powerful. The second one I want to mention is complex network. 
So when we're talking about network, network is basically you have nodes and you have links and you have certain weights on the on the on the, on each of the links. So we can imagine the a lot of uh, a problem in our world is actually networked uh, problem. Water network I have mentioned before. So and uh, transport is a network. If you're talking about the telecommunications network too, you've got a nodes, you've got a you know links, and you have a certain you know whatever volume onto the, that one. And we have social media network. So a lot of them is actually linked as a network. Even our human human body is a network. So how you actually can com uh, understand the com uh, complexity of the how networks actually works, particularly when they don't follow the certain flow. <coughs> and uh, for example, when you block a certain road um, section, and where the mad mouse is going, the, 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 the cars. So we have a huge problem when the Sydney try to build the light rail, cut off half of the George Street, which is a turn into pedestrian. What a surprise. So, what a surprise, yes. And then what a surprise. And then I, I was very lucky or unlucky working on part of that after everything has been done and dusted, so announced the done and dusted, but and, and we try to, I mean, working to oh, where the hotspot will be when you cut off a part of network. So, yeah, I think uh, I have more than enough named to beautiful, beautiful. I I would like to see a different question. I would like to see the question be, how can AI change our lives for the better, rather than how what's the most commercial application? Um, and I, I think one of the things particularly uh, relevant to my own recent experience is that precision medicine idea, but also some of these things are incredibly simple. They don't have to be complex machine learning algorithms to have an AI sitting, auditing the conversation in the doctor's office and chipping into the doctor just quietly. Did you check her blood pressure because might be this condition, you know, just kind of adding because doctors are human and they forget, but that and, and they miss things and, and you know, we've just spent four years trying to diagnose something in my daughter that, that was caused. Long story, but you know, it could have been picked up had there been some kind of systematic process monitoring the, the symptoms and the conversations. But that leads to one of the big problems with AI, which is that adopting AI is a social, uh, socio-political issue as much as it is a technological issue. And finding doctors who are willing to have an AI audit their conversations and contribute to them is really, really hard because they feel, you know, it's a slur on their professionalism, a change in the way they work. It's a really complicated problem to solve. In the same way that we don't like self-driving cars and we won't, like, we won't tolerate a single death caused by a self-driving car, whereas we'll tolerate hundreds of thousands of death caused by people because we're used to that and it's not somehow the same level of threat. So it, the socio-political issues are um, sometimes bigger than the technological ones. It, it's interesting though, self-driving cars are creeping up on us and we don't realize it. Mm. I, I, I was you know, looking, thinking the other day and realizing I'm driving less. I actually, we're increasing the more and more aids, there's blind spot detectors. Mm. I'm not paying, I shouldn't probably admit this in public, <laughs> I'm probably not paying the attention I paid when I was a, a, you know, a learner driver, certainly not. Um, you know, I'm dependent on the technology and slowly but surely it's actually taking over the driving. So we're going to wake up at some point in 10 or 20 years time and realize, oh, the machines are driving. Mm. We're not actually driving anymore. That's right. Do we have any questions from the audience? Probably have time for maybe one short one. Marco Angelini, UTS. Uh, I manage a research program and a schools outreach uh, program at uh, the Women in Engineering and IT. I was intrigued by, by what, you were, what you were saying about how we engage young people, especially um, primary school learners, um, in, in play type areas. We, we actually run a kind of a, a play type program for uh, year five and six students, um, but we do make it um, uh, as purposeful as, as we can, kind of folding in real world problems and solutions to something that they can really um, get, get, get stuck into. Um, but my question is, is, is really about what, what we do more systemically uh, about um, funding issues and, and supporting schools to be able to deliver the kind of purpose-led engineering and problem solving that we're talking about. 
because I, I come from the UK and I was doing similar sorts of jobs in, in, in school outreach there and I was dismayed by the in, inequity in, in funding especially between the private and public system in the UK. I came to Australia thinking things would be better and was just <laughs> shocked at how much worse it is um, in Australia. Yep. It's truly shocking the level of inequity yep. that, that there is in, in, in funding. So my question is, I mean, beyond the obvious, what, what, what do we do about that? What do we do as stakeholders to start uh, trying try to make the point more, more forcefully? Because it, it seems like we have discussions about this kind of thing, you know, Gonski, et cetera, but yeah. here we still are. Well, I'm a data nerd, so my first instinct is collect the data. Like, I work in a lot of different schools, and I go to some of the state schools, and they're literally, you know, the roof is leaking, and they don't have functioning toilets, and go to the private schools with the fancy gymnasiums and the theatres, and, the, and it just it kills me. It's one of the reasons I made my organisation a charity, is to make sure that it, funding is never going to be a barrier to access. But um, once you've collected the data, data itself we know is not persuasive. You actually need to be telling the stories. Um, and I think what we need is to be telling the stories. We need you know, film crews inside those crumbling schools. We need teachers to be platformed and to be telling their stories and saying, you know, I buy my own resources because otherwise we wouldn't have any and, and <laughs> on, a, on a teacher's salary. Um, it, we need to be telling the stories and we need to be telling them really loudly and that means platforming the teachers. And it's, it's not sexy, it's not um, headline grabbing, but that's how you make changes. You, you tell the stories. Mm. We're, I mean, we're, we're citizens at the end of the day and it's a political mm. problem. We may need to make it clear to our political representatives that funding more polo um, pools for rich, expensive schools is not how we should, we should be spending our taxes. Mm. Uh, you know, education is the greatest social leveler in exists, and we should be spending. It's the greatest way out of poverty. Yes. We know that. It's the way it works. It's, it's the greatest investment that we could be making in our future. Is I, I want to throw into that that um, your ATAR is significantly influenced by your postcode, and until we fix that, none of the rest of it matters. Well, I, I don't know. It's, we shouldn't necessarily fix the eight, uh, uh, fix the postcard correlation with ATAR. Perhaps we should fix ATAR. That we, oh, that, we yeah. Put, we put so much <laughs> emphasis on, on people's future that, on, on a single number. Right? <laughs> yep. um, and we've, um, 100%. And, and that, that just excludes people from such a way. Thank you for the asking that question. This evidence-based, uh, evidence fit for purpose, you know, educational programs has been a theme of discussion um, during, during several sessions. I am being told that we are out of time, Cynthia, but certainly we are standing, uh, uh, you know, with the, against lunch. So uh, please uh, join me in thanking our panel speakers. Thank you. Thank you.